turn to Romans 7. I'm applying Romans 8.11 this morning. I had to leave at 2.30 and got back at 6. And I thought I'll just lie down for one hour of 30 minutes, but it didn't work. Okay, Romans, the seventh chapter, starting at verse 7. Last class in Romans, I think we will read verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now notice that the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except by the law, say it, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupience. Oh man, here we come this morning. I know that word, but concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, but that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold, unto sin. All right, here's a beautiful passage. And when we deal with the law, we do not want anyone to subtract from it the value of this great subject. Paul, being a Pharisee and being a scribe, was absolutely trying to obey God and honor God according to to the law. But he could not do so because all the law did to him was frustrate him, condemn him. Especially, here's a man living in self righteousness. Here's a man living in human good. And because of this, he has no power no strength to experience victory. Now, one thing happened to Paul. He had a renewed will. When he saw the law, when he heard the law, when the law came into being in his life, it renewed his will, but it renewed his will without renewed strength. And for this reason, in Romans 7, 6, he uses the word katageo, which means the old sin nature was put out of business. The old man was put out of business. Paul was not talking about being pardoned. He was pardoned, but he was talking about being delivered from the body of death in Romans 7.24. So, Paul experienced a very excellent 
principal. He had a D.D. Everyone loves a D.D. And actually, it means dead and discharged. He was dead and discharged. Having died, he would bear fruit. Having been discharged, he would serve. Now, there was a problem. He was saved, but he still remembered what the law said. But there was indwelling sin in his members. This indwelling sin was very powerful. Verse 11 uh, speaks of it very well. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Indwelling sin. Well, what is this indwelling sin? Well, you ought to know. First of all, we want to give a thorough understanding of the law this morning. Now, we have three principles in the law I want you to write down. The first one is the moral uh, phase of the law. Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. That's the moral phase of the law. If you ever deal with seven-day Adventism, or many different groups such as the world tomorrow, just the plain truth, has a phenomenal professional production with news to get their propaganda out, to get their false doctrine into homes by the millions. They take in approximately now $95 million of tithe money every year. And the, the old man, Mr. Armstrong, died. And... Uh, I mean, imagine that. A false doctrine, a cult, $95 million a year coming in through radio. It's very obvious because they're the only ones that's right, so if you tithe and they believe in tithing, you couldn't possibly give to anyone but them. It's very unique. You must know this doctrine. The second thing is the judgments. That This is the social uh, phase. The judgment. Exodus 21 to 23. Now the judgments deal aspects of life such as quarantine, diet, which we're going to do here but not according to this judgment. Now, uh, marriage, military training, and so on, called the judgments. Then we have the third thing, the spiritual principles, the ordinances. Exodus 25 to 41. The ordinances. Now, the ordinances deal with specialized priesthood, structure of worship, Sabbaths, sacred furniture, and its significance of the law of the offerings. So, we have this address to Israel, the way of life for the nation. Both believers and unbelievers were addressed by these things. Now, the book of Hebrews concerns itself with the ordinances. The book of Galatians concerns itself with the commandments and occasionally in the ceremonial. We want you to notice that the Galatians believers, the Galatian believers, wanted to be under the Mosaic law in Galatians 4.21, but they could not stand they couldn't stand. So, the law teaches that all are sinners in Romans 3.20, Romans in Galatians 3.24. It puts every person in prison in Galatians 3.23 and Romans 3.19. The law shuts up every single mouth in Romans 3.19. Every mouth may be closed. Boy, the law is holy, all right. Just and good if it does that. And if it could be effective. <laughs> now, Jesus Christ, absolutely, in Romans 7, 12,
perfectly fulfill the law. Now, the law cannot ever give us a goal. The law cannot give a single person a goal. Romans 3.28, Galatians 2.16. And the law can never help us live right because it cannot produce spirituality. The law cannot produce spirituality in Galatians 5.23, Romans 8.4, and Romans 5.20. Therefore, if it cannot produce spirituality, is it still good? And the answer is, of course it's good, it's holy, and it's perfect. But one thing that the law does, the Bible teaches that the law is for those that are not convinced of sin yet in Exodus 23 to 17. It's for those that were not convinced of sin. Now in Exodus 20, three pairs corresponding to the first table of the Decalogue deals with the offenses against God. So the three pairs under the first table of the Decalogue of the Moral Law that des definitely gives offenses against God. Now Paul lists the violators of the first five commandments on the second table of the Decalogue, and that's those who would murder their father and mother and, and, and also adulterers, people that live in sexual perversions in the seventh commandment, and so on. So we have the liars, the perjurers, and the Word of God deals with all of these lawbreakers, rebels, unholy, not devout, irreligious, and profane. So the, the law here is very unique in revealing the character and nature of God and the absolutely bankruptcy of man. Now many, many people, because of this, enter into systems of legalism in our age, in the churches around America and around the world today. They do not teach that they're necessarily under the law the same way other people do, the Mosaic law, the moral aspect to make them spiritual, to establish their self-righteousness and human good. But they cater to legalism, which is a parent relative to the law. Now, you'll see systems of legalism in people's personality and what they imitate in their imitation of speech and mannerisms and dress you'll see all kinds of legalism. Therefore, uh, part of the systems of legalism also deal with relativity. And I think relativity in legalism is very obvious. Relatively means your sins are worse than mine. Relativity simply means I'm more spiritual than you are. That's quite obvious, isn't it? to be late this morning, to be out from 2.30 to 6. Obviously, I'm more spiritual than you are because I, I, I didn't get as much sleep and I was serving God. So I, I can just say that there, that one thing right there, at least last night, see, that's, that's legalism. And it's a bunch of foolishness. All right. Aesthetics, emotionalism, groaning, through tongues, swooning, almost getting in trances with your eyes closed for hours. That's, that's legalism. Because now I'm spiritual. I'm in a swooning mood. And funny languages are coming out of me. All right? Pseudo-spirituality. You can chalk it up as pseudo-spirituality. Another principle of legalism is asceticism. Asceticism thinks that self-sacrifice pleases the Lord. 
extreme self-denial means I am more spiritual. They never heard the verse, seek ye the kingdom of God first, and he'll add all these things unto you. That would scare them to death. Why, if God ever started adding things unto them, they'd have to get rid of them immediately because that doesn't line up with <laughs> the law of asceticism. Self-sacrifice, that's the way to go. Go without food, stay in a little one little tiny room and serve and get weird and get queer up there in that little room and come out with your long things on and go and visit and act weird and silent, never smile and all the TV would be terrible, unbelievably evil because you've got this little room and you're getting weird and, you, and you're practicing asceticism and you are in an evil system. You are in an evil religious system by practicing asceticism. And asceticism in forms has entered into many pulpits that some of us used to be associated with. <laughs> we thank God for the good things. We were not running anybody down. But we were influenced somewhat by forms of asceticism. Well, this always backfires because you can only put so much under the lid and do everything under your power to keep the lid down. And finally, reality and truth blows that lid wide open and what you're really like comes out. <laughs> now, another thing that I want, want to bring in this morning, I must do this. Now, hear me carefully. Self does not cancel out self. <laughs> Say that back to me. Self does not cancel out self. So it's a wrong understanding of crucifixion of self. Making retroactive truth as an experience when it's first only a position that must be learned as an experience. So here's this amazing principle of crucifixion of self. And boy, these people that get into crucifixion of self, they are really something. I am crucified. I am crucified. I used to see them when I was a supervisor for the Northeast Crusade. And they would come in and want to be members from the Northeast Seaboard. And they would be sitting in the office waiting for their appointment. And they would have that, that look on. You just knew <laughs> that these people were something. That pious look. <laughs> Always reading the Bible. Missing meals and reading the Bible. Couldn't talk about a thing but the Bible. Well, they were entering into crucifixion of self. Crucifixion of self is a historical fact. And self cannot cancel out self. Paul had a renewed will, but he didn't have a renewed mind. And it brought him all kinds of frustrations. Well... Lawlessness means to be outside of the law of the spirit of life in Romans 8, 2 to 4. Lawlessness is to be outside of the spirit of life. May I say this? 1 John 3, 4 says, uh, it defines sin as the transgression of the law. That is not referring to the Mosaic law. I always thought it was, but it isn't. It is not referring to the Mosaic Law. It is referring to the law of spirituality. And what is the spirituality? Accepting what Jesus Christ accomplished, achieved, and fulfilled. And now the law of righteousness is fulfilled in us in Romans 8, 4. 
For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now that's the law of spirituality in its basic premise. Now, if I violate the finished work, I'm transgressing the new law. In other words... If I fail, I'm not to be guilty. I'm, in, I'm not to live in a guilt complex. I'm to confess it. And specifically confess it. And when I confess it, I'm yielding to spirituality. Are you listening? Yielding is, is totally perverted today. Yielding is not yielding to something as you may think yielding is. Yielding is simply confessing your sin and accepting spirituality at the point of confession. That's yielding. It's yielding to the finished work. It's yielding to the grace of God. It's yielding to the shed blood. It's yielding to the throne of mercy. That's what yielding is. It's accepting the truth just as the truth is under the new covenant. And that's the law of spirituality. So 1 John 3, 4 is not violating the Mosaic law. It is violating the law of spirituality. And, and if you heard this this morning, you, you won't hear this in very many pulpits. You will in some, thank God, across the world. But not in very many. You must get this straight. The law of spirituality. Now... Sin was in the world before the Mosaic Law in Romans 5, 13 to 16. Sin was in the world before the Mosaic Law. But the Mosaic Law revealed and defined sin that was already in the world. In Romans 14, 23, the carnal believer is lawless because he operates outside of fellowshipping with God. The carnal believer is lawless because he's operating outside of spiritual grace in life. The believer is under the control of the old sin nature, does lawlessness in 1 John 1, 6, in 1 John 2, 11. The carnal believer walks in darkness and can only imitate the unbeliever in 1 Corinthians 3, 3. Darkness emphasizes ignorance toward the word of God. So lawlessness is quenching the spirit in 1 Thessalonians 5.19 and grieving the spirit in Ephesians 4.30. That's lawlessness because the spirit produces the fruit of resurrection life and therefore when that fruit is not being produced, the believer is lawless, is lawless and he's transgressing the law of spirituality. Legalism then teaches heresy pertaining to circumcision and judging and taboos. It teaches heresy. Well, just for a moment this morning, I want you to, to think of God's grace with us. Now, in comparison to law, here is God's grace. Now, salvation, as we all know, is absolutely ascribed to the grace of God. Justification in Romans 3.24, is given to us by grace. Salvation in Acts 15.10, Titus 2.11. Justification in Romans 3.24. Eternal security is the work of grace in Romans 5.2. Standing in it, perfect tense. Effective service is accomplished by grace. 1 Corinthians 15.10. I am what I am, serving God by grace. Why are you serving God? You're a blasphemer. You're this, you're that. Well, I am what I am, serving God in my position because of grace, said Paul. Blameless walk, 2 uh, Corinthians 1.12. The blameless walk comes because of grace. Consolation, 2 Thessalonians 2.16. Grace, strength. Amazing strength in the inner man, 2 Timothy 2, 1, grace. Deliverance from the dominion of sin, uh, Romans six thirteen grace. The age of grace is a dispensation today like the law was in the Mosaic time. So therefore, 
we want to give you quickly the doctrine of spirituality. The doctrine of spirituality is an amazing relationship with Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that makes God's plan revealed in details of life. Now, spirituality is not first the indwelling of the Spirit. It's the results of the filling of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit fills, reveals, guides, and leads with his specific conviction. Here's what a spiritual person does. He's completely established in grace in Hebrews 13, 9. He confesses every time he fails. 1 John 1, 9. That's yielding to the finished work, accepting it unconditionally. He walks in doctrine. 3 John 3, categorical doctrine. Hebrews 4, 1 to 3. He mixes faith with everything he hears. Galatians 5, 16. He walks in the spirit that he doesn't fulfill the lust of the flesh. 1 John 1, 7. He walks in the light. He walks in the light. Romans 6, 4. He walks in the newness of life. Galatians 5, 2. He walks in love. Ephesians 4, 1. He walks in his vocation. And Colossians 1, 10. He walks in in wisdom, and that is a worthy walk before his God. In Romans 13, 13, and 14, he walks by being quickened, by being awakened, and therefore God teaches him that spirituality is absolute. It's a manifestation of love within in Romans 5, 5. He grows continually and he becomes mature in every single area of life. He understands that God is not the author of sin, neither does God solicit sin, because that would be incompatible with his nature and with his essence. God cannot condone sin. Now, this type of believer, then, is consistently understanding this. Awakest thou that sleepest. What does awakest thou that sleepest mean in Ephesians 5.14? It means somebody that lives in ignorance and doctrine isn't active. And they're sleeping pertaining to doctrine. Now, let me illustrate it. I've heard of 500 messages. But I'm upset this morning. I'm downcast. I'm worried. I'm unhappy. I'm a doctrinal sleeper. And Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus. Awakest thou that you, you that are not utilizing doctrine, get awake. Then he says, arise from the dead. He's talking about one of seven principles of death in the doctrine of death. This one is temporal death. Temporal death means a Christian out of fellowship with resurrection life. So here's a Christian that knows doctrine, but doctrine has gone to sleep. Because the Christian is out of fellowship. And as the Christian is out of fellowship, God said, come on, awake into a category right now. And, and I, be, be quickened, be raised from the dead. In other words, you're in temporal death. If you talk a lot, you're in temporal death. If you worry, you're in temporal death. If you can't stay awake, you're in temporal death. If you're a dried up kind of Christian, you're in temporal death. And that's very serious. Temporal death means Satan has access to you in just about every area in the world except he can't steal your salvation. He has access to you. That's why we quicken ourselves. Awakest thou that the, the person that isn't utilizing doctrine because you're in temporal death. You're out of fellowship with life. And if you're out of fellowship with life, that's as bad as it can get on this life. For a Christian. Well, that's very interesting. I particularly like it. It means indifference, apathy. And when you are quickened, you start reflecting the light of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. 
The Bible says walk circumspectly, not as fools in Ephesians 5.15. That's interesting because the fool lives under the control of the old sin nature. And no matter how many times you tell him not to, the damn fool keeps right on doing it. Well, he's damned as far as temporal death goes. He's not damned for eternity, but he's damned in temporal death. He's out of fellowship. That person tries to get you to give him something to change, and he won't even utilize the doctrine that you gave him. And therefore, he isn't utilizing the mind of God, and he isn't being spirit control. He's operating in lawlessness outside of the law of spirituality. How many understand that? I didn't look to see how many. <laughs> okay. We have to close now. But the believer has a positional relationship with God through the word and the spirit and experiential relationship to God. And he has an eternal ongoing relationship with God. Now, when a believer sins, faith brings him back into fellowship, not yielding to some abstract religious symbol or legalism or a taboo or of law. In the law of spirituality in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Romans 6.19, 8.10, Colossians 1.27, and we have this great principle. The believer first understands he's going to yield to grace. The aorist tense in fellowship in time means not just once, but every time he gets out of fellowship. Every time he gets out of fellowship, he confesses and yields to grace. That's the law of spirituality. Um, there's a positive side, he has fullness of joy. There's a negative side, he doesn't practice sin. The, positive, the, the human side is he knows doctrine and applies it. The divine side is he has an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is always interceding for him in 1 John 2, 2 and Hebrews seven twenty six. So, he yields, and as he yields and confesses his sin, if I confess a sin at 9... 45 this morning, I committed at 9.43, then I'm yielding. That's what yielding is. And I get out of fellowship at 9.43, and at 9.45, I'm back in fellowship. I just yielded. What did I yield to? The finished work. The law of spirituality. I utilize my assets of 1 John 1, 9. And God said, don't you transgress that. I don't want you to go around with a guilt complex. If you do, that's sin. That's unbelief. So, I do not want you to do it. How many understand this now? All right. Father, dismiss us in Jesus' name. Amen.